You're listening to episode two of the Frem Request by Alex Ford. Outside, it was raining. Standing on the doorstep, he considered popping back inside to grab his umbrella, but the shop was only at the end of the road, and it was just a light drizzle. There was nothing like rain in summer to dampen his spirits further. Not that it mattered what season it was: winter and raining, autumn and raining, spring and raining. He sometimes doubted that the English Channel was sea at all, just a valley that was permanently flooded. Typical English bloody weather. As the rain fell on him, he wondered if rain was so synonymous with England, why the English language had so pathetically few words associated with it: rain, shower, drizzle, downpour, splattering, spots of rain, precipitation. He couldn't think of any more. It just seemed insufficient to sum up something that blighted the lives of an entire nation. The English language just didn't reflect how much it rained in England. The Inuit had the right idea. Snow was pretty significant to them, and they'd managed to come up with loads of words to describe it. He had only managed to think of seven words for rain, and he was loath to include precipitation because nobody, except weather reporters, used that word, and it was only their way of pretending that there was some amazing science involved in predicting the great British weather. Hey, folks! Rain again today. Well, any Tom, Dick, or Harry can come up with that, but. There's a 90% chance of precipitation in the lower coastal areas. Well, that just sounds so much more sciency. As he made his way down the road, he could feel a black cloud descending over him. Unfortunately for David, it had very little to do with the weather. The bell tinkled as he entered Ashwa's mini emporium. The owner, Mr. Ashwa, was standing in his usual spot behind the counter. Because of the thieving teenagers from the nearby council estate, the shopkeeper had trained his eyes to move independently of each other, so he could keep one eye on the door and the other on his CCTV screen. The local kids were getting out of control. The response of the local liberal government was to pamper them, trying desperately to include them within society and make them feel like they belonged. Only last week, Mr. Ashwa was telling David about a rumor going around the estate that the local education authority were going to add shoplifting as a GCSE, so the chav generation could leave school with one qualification they gained through their own merit. Apparently, the idea was soon dropped when some smarty pants pointed out that for them to leave school, they would have to attend in the first place. Some said it was a shame because the kids would have excelled. They certainly made an effort, getting progressively bolder with their shoplifting activities. Only last week, a group of fourteen-year-olds had tried to return a porno magazine they'd stolen the previous day. The teenagers were skinny and malnourished, already with nicotine-stained teeth. Fresh food to them was adding boiling water to a pot noodle. And despite the fact that because of their stunted growth, they'd needed to give each other a bunk up to be able to reach the top shelf, they thought they were tough. A ginger-haired teenager with really angry, pus-filled spots pulled the already tattered copy of Penthouse Letters from the pocket of his hoodie and complained, "Ain't enough pictures. Give our money back." When Mr. Ashwa took the magazine and refused to give them a refund, they started shouting at him, "Fucking Muslim! 'Cause of immigrants like you, this country's fucked." The shopkeeper merely shook his head in despair and wondered if his bright orange turban could be a more obvious sign of his religious devotion. Obviously not. Calmly, he placed his hands onto the counter and looked straight at his accusers. No, my friends, it is because of ignorant imbeciles like you that this country is, as you so eloquently put it, fucked. Well, why did you call us? One of the other teenagers said, a confused look on his oily face. Exactly," replied the shopkeeper, clicking his fingers. And with that, Mr. Ashwa opened his jacket to reveal a vest with long red tubes strapped to it. The thugs knew the tubes contained explosives because the word "explosives" was written down the side in thick black pen. Slowly and deliberately, Mr. Ashwa placed his right hand over the red button attached to one of the tubes. Then, with his hand hovering over the "press here" sign, he closed his eyes. Cleared his throat with a cough and started to mutter what sounded to the teenagers like a prayer. Das hari baktalan kandi kandi han. Das hari baktalan kandi kandi han. Jeki hari baktal kandi tong ji. Po tong hajgam po te kandi koni hai. That was as far as he got. 
Mr. Ashwa opened his eyes a little and saw the thugs running, terrified, from his shop. Who would think that the nursery rhyme, Ten Green Bottles, sung in the shopkeeper's native Punjabi, sounded so terrifying? Laughing heartedly, he unstrapped the vest and placed it on the floor next to the till. He was so sick and tired of the teenagers from the local council estate accusing him of being a terrorist that he'd asked his wife, a seamstress, to make him something that looked like a suicide bomber's vest. It was cruelly designed, made from kitchen paper tubes and string, and he could hardly believe those idiots had fallen for it. He laughed for hours as he played the scene over and over on his CCTV. Even his wife, who had been reluctant to be part of this trick, saw the funny side. That morning, though, the shop was empty, and Mr. Ashwa could give David his undivided attention and the focus of both eyes. David walked into the shop in a trance-like state. Although the walk had started to clear his mind, he was still struggling to understand why he was feeling like this. His memory seemed to reach a certain point, then jump like a record stuck in a scratched groove. The shopkeeper, ever cordial, greeted David warmly. Ah, David, my number one customer. How are you this lovely day? And how is your writing? Coming along nicely, yes? Um, slowly, David replied, absent-mindedly. Slowly was the rather euphemistic description of David's writing. Stagnant would have been a more accurate answer. The truth was, the manuscript David had been working on since moving to this neighbourhood two years ago had remained untouched for several months. It was, by all accounts, a very funny sitcom, and no doubt several production companies would show an interest, if only David could finish it. Part of his procrastination was due to the fact that it was the only thing he'd really tried at, and the thought of it failing, or people telling him it wasn't any good, stifled his creativity to such an extent that a suitable ending eluded him. If you don't mind me saying so, you seem a little distracted this morning continued the shopkeeper, his head wobbling slightly as he spoke. David mumbled his reply, feeling rather like a naughty schoolchild. Yes, well, the thing is, Mr. Ashwa, I, I need to buy a packet of cigarettes. Need to buy a packet of cigarettes? I'm afraid that isn't possible, my friend, because of our agreement, yes? The agreement. Three weeks ago, when David was thinking about stopping smoking, he had the bright idea of removing as many temptations as possible, including the source of his addiction, and so enlisted the help of his local friendly shop owner. He had given strict instructions that if he succumbed to nicotine cravings, Mr. Ashwa wasn't to sell him any cigarettes. Mr. Ashwa, though, a shrewd businessman, wasn't too happy about this. It doesn't make much business sense, he'd said. And what with the Tesco Express just opened not but a stone's throw down the road? I need all the business I can get, yes? In the end, David had to agree to spend the same amount on other things. They struck a deal that David would spend the equivalent of a packet of fags every day in return for the shopkeeper not selling him any. It was a rather bizarre arrangement and it was probably embarrassment more than anything which prevented David from buying them. For the last three weeks, David continued his routine of popping into the corner shop on his way to work every morning. But now, instead of spending £5.23 on his daily habit of 20 Marlboro Light, he bought five Kit Kats, three cans of Coke, two packets of Quavers, four bags of Walker's Cheese and Onion Crisps, and the remainder he spent on Cherry Drops. At least it kept him sweet with the receptionist at work, who was rather fond of confectionery. Just his luck, then, that the little Indian was as stubborn as he was business-savvy and refused point-blank to hand over David's much-missed and, at that moment, much-needed cigarettes. Mr. Ashwa tilted his head in mock pity and reached for a container of boiled sweets from a shelf behind the counter. How about some lovely cola drops for a change, yes? He said in what was meant to be a comforting voice. David could feel his face redden with frustration. Getting more cigarettes was now his sole focus. Of course, it was for his own good, but being denied them was starting to aggravate him like crazy. He knew there was little point in trying to persuade Mr. Ashwa otherwise. He might as well give up and try another shop. Feeling foolish enough that he was trying to break his own agreement in the first place and not wanting to create a scene, he turned on his heel and left the shop. Outside, the light drizzle was now a steady downpour, so by the time David walked ten minutes further down the road to the Tesco Express, which so threatened Mr. Ashwa's livelihood, he was soaked through. The rain, though, had a cooling effect on his emotions and helped clear his thoughts.
David told himself that he was being silly and melodramatic. And as the rain ran down the back of his neck, he struggled to remember what it was that had caused him to act so neurotically. Why had the sight of Barry Taylor's name on his computer screen sent him into a nicotine frenzy, if indeed it had been the trigger? Now he was embarrassed. Come to think of it, he didn't have an explanation as to why he'd run up to the shop like a nicotine whore. He'd stopped smoking, for God's sake, and was doing fine. Just recently, he'd noticed stronger, bigger erections, just as the leaflet reasons to quit smoking from the local chemist promised he would. Maybe it was early dementia, but it would have to be incredibly eager, surely, to arrive at 33. David wondered if it was radiation from his computer screen. Or maybe, he concluded, it was just nicotine withdrawals. Recently, he'd read a story about a man who'd battered his wife to death because she'd forced him to stop smoking. Without the relief of popping out for a cigarette every 20 minutes, the man had found her company intolerable. Walking along the wet street, David forced himself to laugh a little and despite the rain, managed to light the cigarette. Like a fog receding, the panic disappeared. In control of his emotions again, David decided that whoever this Barry Taylor was, he would ignore his request to add him as a friend and continue with his life. And when the time was right, he would stop smoking again. There was, however, one niggling memory somewhere in the back of his mind which wouldn't quite let go. The Friend Request by Alex Ford is available at Amazon, the iBookstore, Kobo Books, and Barnes & Noble.